Welcome, digital natives. This is, uh, you know, somebody asked me, are you a digital native? So I said, probably you don't know my age. Maybe I'm digitally naive and not native. So I'm certainly not going to pretend that I'm an expert in the field of digital. What I wanted to share with you today is like any other company, we are staring at this world, a billion dollar company, and as the CEO of the company, I'm trying to make a choice as to what am I going to do to make sure that my company survives and excels as the world of digital unfolds. Because you're going to have an opportunity to listen to lots of experts, Mook, Harvey, Meg, Ravi, all Christopher. They're all immersed in these areas. They are going to share their point of view. So experts are going to share their perspective. I thought it would be far more useful for me to share with you as to, as a CEO of the company, when I get to hear what is happening in the digital world, what worries me? What do I do? What actions do I take? What actions am I planning to take for the company? Less to do about telling you that you, know, you should be buying this or whatever. Like any other company, I'm confronted with this reality. So I thought I'll take you through that journey. So let me start with a perspective that I share about digital. I have lots of consultants who come and tell me that you should do this, ranging from McKinsey to Bain and all of that. But when I saw a parallel, I went to read a little bit about the Industrial Revolution, which happened in 1860s. Wave one lasted about, I believe, 60 to 80 years. And then wave two, that uh, took another 40 to 50 years. So the Industrial Revolution occupied close to 100 years. This was in 1800s. And after that, when I read the history, we have seen changes, but we haven't experienced a revolution. And I have a point of view that this is actually a revolution. This is not a technological development. And why I share that view is what I want to share with you. It's just a perspective, and I'm willing to hear your perspective, because that is what is shaping my decisions about emphasis. Let's go back to 1800s. It started predominantly in the manufacturing area. They used water and steam, followed by electricity, to change the way things were being manufactured. Started in England, started in textile industry first, and then spread on to various industry, manufacturing. Then people saw it spreading to transportation. They had steam-powered boats which were traveling. Then they had railroad-based steam engines. And that took place. Communication. For the first time, they had something called telegraph. right? And they laid a cable across the Atlantic. That was the first time Telegraph started communicating from one continent to the other. This all happened together, simultaneously, changing the very way people used to make money, employment used to be generated, uh, governments used to be formed, regulations used to exist. Everything changed completely, making people feel disoriented. There was employment on one side, unemployment on the other side, incomes were going up, and on the other hand, people also saw that lots of people were not making money. That's what depicted industrial revolution. Let's see, when people come and talk to me about digital, I start thinking, is it something similar we are about to experience? And we are so lucky, to be honest, because our skills are going to get tested. Our imagination is going to be stretched. Our capability is going to be expanded. Our leadership is going to be challenged because we are witnessing the revolution as we speak. Will it last five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? I don't know. But it certainly won't take 100 years because everything which used to take 100 years is 
now going to be done in probably 10 years. And why I believe that you're seeing this as a revolution? Let's start with manufacturing. What is happening in manufacturing? One of the biggest thing which is happening in manufacturing is 3D printers. I read an article uh, two weeks ago that General Electric has decided to manufacture aircraft engines using additive printing methodology using a 3D printer. Who would have thought that that's going to be the case? So manufacturing 3D printers is going to revolutionize. So that was the manufacturing. Then let's talk about the next aspect, the whole transportation. This is fascinating because while I'm not an expert, I met some people who are called futurists. I mean, I wonder whether uh, there is a profession called futurist. The good news is you can predict and you're not held accountable for those predictions. Um, you know what, uh, this feels like a, a, a stock analyst, right? That guy predicts my next quarter and when I don't make that number, he is not held accountable, I'm held accountable. <laughs> so futurists are somewhat uh, like that. But you know, I was having this discussion and then he said cars, all major brands have announced plans to have driverless cars in three years' time. Whether you talk to Volvo, General Motors, Mercedes-Benz, driverless cars. What will be the impact? I don't know whether it will happen in three years, or four years, five years, but it will happen. And I'm not here to speak about Uber, Airbnb, because everybody talks about those, um, uh, those uh, examples. I have a physical presence. I'm not born digital. I have to figure out how a physical business can become digitally successful. So I have to learn the art of coexistence. I'm not a purebred digital company today. And that is the challenge which I'm facing. So that being the case, if it is a driverless car, you com combine it with Uber. Now let's look at the ecosystem of driverless cars, okay? Insurance companies who provide automobile insurance, they are investing a lot on telematics to analyze driver behavior so they can adjust the premiums based on driver behavior. So they make the risk assessment around a driver. Now if there is no driver, what kind of insurance? Who is going to be insured? If there is a traffic violation, I was asking this question, if there is a traffic violation, what happens? So they said, but driverless cars are not supposed to have traffic violation. But it is impossible to envisage that three years later, all cars would be driverless. You will have driver full cars and driverless cars. And suppose something goes wrong, slippery road, driverless car skids, goes and hits another car. Now the cop turns up, who should he talk to? So, law and order, right? Then, so insurance, law and order. Now let's talk about how the cars, once they are manufactured, how they are transported. You have seen they come by ships, and from ships they have specifically made vehicles where 15, 20 cars, if you are driving next to it, you feel almost scared that one of the cars is about to drop on you, so you speed ahead to make sure that the time uh, parallel driving with that vehicle is less. Now, if it is a driverless car, you punch in the data, the car is going to reach there on its own. Why do you need these big, tr big trucks? Now, let's talk about ownership. Why do we want to own the car if it is driverless? Because today, I can say, I want Ferrari and an Uber-like thing and say, get me Ferrari and Ferrari will come pick me up in three minutes and go. Tomorrow, I may say, I want Toyota, third day I may say BMW, fourth day. So I have a choice. And like the, in IT world, you have cloud has brought down the cost of computing, a shared uh, driverless car world where I can choose any car because the latency is going to be lower, 
probably is going to cost me less and it is going to give me like different kind of food, one day Italian, another day Indian. I can have cars. So the whole concept of buying cars may undergo a change. So car manufacturers have to think instead of providing transport vehicles, they may have to provide transportation service. So this is one, driverless car. Now let's go further. If the cars get manufactured through 3D printers, what would China do, right? The big uh, work, I mean all the factory workers, what are they going to do? Governments have taxes to import cars. You're not going to import a car. The digit will flow through the network and the car will get manufactured in your country. Government's income will dip. What are they going to tax? Doesn't, I mean when I think about all this, I see a parallel. This is exactly what happened in 1800s. There was a sense of change everywhere. Nobody, no place you can hide. Everywhere changes were taken. And I'm not saying it will happen today, tomorrow, but it is bound to happen. I believe in those days, they were called Laddites. I don't know any one of you who were, who were thinking that this revolution is not going to happen and they were sticking their head in the mud and they were resisting the change. So one of the things I was told, don't be a Luddite. <laughs> right? So if this is happening, am I as an IT service provider immune to these changes? Can I continue to behave the same old way and expect my business the same old way? Can I go quarter on quarter basis, look at my investors and say with confidence, you don't have to worry, I got you covered. Can I say that? It's a tough ask. Can I dismantle my heritage which is not necessarily digital and say, chh, chh, let me start afresh and I'm going to be digital. Not possible because next quarter result is also going to dictate my share price. I have physical structure, I have people, I have command and control systems, I have everything in place including the analysts, the way they view me is, is uh, if I can call it the analog way. I have to learn the art of coexisting because the whole world is not going to uh, turn into digital tomorrow, some part of it will be and I have business to manage. What am I doing? And that's what I want to share. In this journey, we decided that there is only one axis on which we will seek stability because everything else can change. And that axis is supremely important to us. And I changed the organizational structure, compensation model, how we look at things on that axis. And that axis is called customer. I have turned the organization on its head to say, and have, I, we, have we arrived? Absolutely not. I'm not going to uh, say that we have reached that destination. I'll share with you some specific changes that we have made in the company, believing that that is the single axis which offers you hope as the world around us is going to change. Multiple speed, different axes, every, we will feel disoriented. So the, the whole orientation will be on that single axis called customer. So what did we do? We said the single thing which under the customer we have to define is the experience which the, we want to have in those customers. And experience we said in two parts. We all talk about, oh, this customer gives me, he's my number one customer, that's why it is important. But that's not what is important. The question is, does the customer believe you are important? Your access of stability is not whether you, are, you think that the customer is important. You have to think about, everybody, somebody asked me, do you know Obama? I said, yeah. But that's not the question. The question is, does Obama know you, right? So the, the point is, does the customer believe you are important? Are you relevant? 
And for that, we have changed the organizational structure completely. I won't go into details because this is not about organizational design session, but I can tell you, I announced a major restructuring which was based on defining the customer experience, defining the customer relevance, and then I started, we started going into the internal wiring of the organization. One thing which is dramatically going to change as we enter this digital revolution is a concept called clock speed. So when Apple Watch was announced, I have some, my direct team members who are Apple enthusiasts. And immediately I get a message, Ganesh, should I book one Apple Watch for you? So, and this gentleman uh, shared a story. I want to share this, i um, deviating a little bit. He shared a story. He has two kids, a son and a daughter. And his daughter, uh, his second child was born eight years after his first child. So when his son uh, grew up in US, it is uh, a statutory responsibility of the parents that you have to take them to Toys R Us on a regular basis. And like a good parent, he took the first child to Toys R Us. So I was asking him, how about the second child? He said, oh my God, I forgot. I have not taken her to Toys R Us. So I told him, I had a conversation with one of the firms which uh, is invested and looking at the world digital. Do you know which is the biggest competition to Toys R Us? iPad, exactly. It is iPad. So it's not another toy store. It is that piddly little device. And now, while the first uh, child of his is very adept, the second child has a weekly list for uh, her father that this is the new app, which is a cool app. Dad, get, get one for me. And for that, they don't have to go to Toys R Us. So technically, a digital native thinks and acts and behaves differently. So coming back to uh, the Apple Watch, I wrote to this gentleman, it's not about watch, my friend. It is about the clock speed. So what we are working on is how do we increase the clock speed of everything that we do? Can I use automation? Can I use disruptive methodology? Can I use disruptive models? Second thing, partnerships. Traditionally, IT service providers have rushed to all those biggies who are successful big brand names. They are also suffering from this challenge of how to be competing in digital. And they are on the same board, so I'm not expecting them to help us. So we are rushing to startups. Our entire partnership model is changing to, to gear towards startup because they are thought provoking. And in fact, what we did is we created our own startup because we want to bring something uniquely different in the space of governance, risk, and compliance. And I was confident that if I do it within the company, the corporate antibodies will kill it. So we built a startup. So clock speed and different partnership. Third, people. Traditionally, the people structure which people have followed is a pyramid. Pyramid is an old world borrowed model from armed forces, command and control, imperfect communication, physical management. Hence, you know, span of control is important. So boop, 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 waterfall. In today's modern world, where communication is doing very well, pyramid is no good. You need experts and you need doers. Bright, young kids out of the school. In fact, I didn't want to dress up like this. And I said, why can't I turn up in jeans? And somebody said, this is New York, Ganesh. <laughs> New York. So I said, but this is a digital event. So, uh, you know, I have a lot of people who are very, very, uh, they are not compliant people. Don't believe if they say that they take my decisions seriously. They said, but 80% of your business comes from physical world, so get real, dress up. So I, I turned up like this. So we are changing the pyramid into an hourglass. Experts and doers. 
and the type of people that we are hiring, we are also looking at not so compliant, very bright, and we are taking bright kids to senior leadership position because it's not chronological seniority anymore. That's the company I'm trying to build. And I'm trying to build it in such a way that I stay in rhythm with my clients. I help them cut costs in legacy, invest in newer areas. I have changed my portfolio set. I have looked at everything in the company so I can do two things. I can become future relevant and I can manage the quarters, both because as a CEO, I don't have a choice. If I go to the street and I say, wait for five years and you will see a good quarter because I have decided to be digital, you can trust that next quarter my successor will be talking to you. So hence, that is the reality. For that, the, the thing which we are focused on, customer, customer experience. On that note, I thank you for being here and that is why this introduction of digital customer experience is important because if you choose to make customer as the axis, a holistic perspective of designing their experience and taking a digital journey will help you to manage the current and blend it with the future and make the customer central to everything that one does. And changing customer behavior, so now people are talking about customer segmentation not only based on affordability, but based on behavioral segmentation of customers. Hence, you cannot kill the old quickly and move completely to new. Ubers, Airbnb are pure digital companies, very excited like movie stars. That doesn't mean that we should all be, try and become movie stars because for every two movie stars, there are 300 who didn't make it. We have to think about what is the journey for us. And that journey around your customer, in my mind, is what I'm doing for emphasis and I hope that you will share your perspective, enjoy this event, and make customer central to it, and look at the framework that we are presenting, which is digital customer experience. You can never go wrong if you go on a customer because it has been proven through multiple revolution that if you make customer central to everything that you do, not only you will survive, you will excel. Once again, I thank you for your time, for your business, for your patience, and for your expertise that you have brought here. I would love to hear your perspective as well, and I give you uh, our commitment that we will manage this duality by focusing on the customer, and last but not least, by focusing on you. Thank you so much, good luck, and we'll stay connected.